looking at the time, I don't think we're going to be able to do much of the Esquire paper. No, no, I'll do the Esquire uh, paper. Yeah. Just that we do the uh, educational games. I think it's an interesting question. Are they worth the effort? Uh, meaning, do it actually improve the learning experience and effectiveness, whatever that means? Um, and uh, Buckley and Hendrick did a paper here, and, and at the meta level, I also like literature surveys. Uh, since I'm a pragmatist, I start from a model and I do the active testing on top. I, I find it easier to deal with details when I have an overall backbone to connect everything to. And these survey papers, they're trying to, to create a backbone, trying to look at what has been done and, and create some structure, some overview. And I, I, I'm very much in favor of these kind of papers. Um, they give you a nice starting point. So, um, what I'll talk about here is not necessarily what you read in the paper, because what you read in the paper is there. So I reflect more on their design, how they design the literature study, more on the type of games. I mean, some of it is, of course, in the papers, but I'm also going to have my comments that goes a little bit beyond what is what you can read there. So, what do they set out to do? Well, they want to look at effectiveness of education games. What they did is to do a literature study. They went through papers uh, to look at uh, those gay education game papers that spe said specifically about whether it improved something or it did not improve. So look looked at the effectiveness. And they, uh, they're studying different types of uh, studies and some methodology trends like is who is evaluating the project. Is it the developers of the game or is it some some of the external, and then will there possibly be any bias because of that? So, what they did, and I think this is something for you if you were to do a literature study. This is, uh, I think, a good uh, uh, recipe for how to do that. So, what they did is that they decided that they just wanted to look at journal papers. There are lots of conference papers as well, but they ignore them, just journal papers in reviewed journals, and they defined a 10 year period, 2002, 2012, maybe that is 11 years, if it's end to end, something like that. Um, and they identified different search engines that they used, 16 different, to make sure that they had a good coverage. Um, they had words like media game, computer game, education, training, evaluation, empirical evaluation, effectiveness. So these were the type of combinations and uh, words they used, and they would have various combinations to try to get as many papers as possible. So typically you will like to have uh, uh, lots of papers back, so high recall if you are into information retrieval, high recall. But precision isn't good, which means that lots of the papers that you get aren't relevant. So you need to spend a lot of time to just throw away papers that, that the, uh, came out from this search. But at least you, they try to and hope that they get a good coverage. So they started with this huge pile of, of, uh, of uh, results from the search engines, and they identified 120 papers that were relevant. And there were some duplicates, and there were 99 unique papers, and then only 40 of those fulfilled the characteristics that they had empirical data uh, about the effectiveness, and it was in a formalized school context. They wanted to see used in school, not, not the game that anyone could use individually. So this is how they ended up with the 40 papers. These, these 40 papers are the ones that they analyzed, they studied, and then tried to draw conclusions uh, out of that set. So one dimension I looked at is what topics? And you can see math is definitely a big, big chunk here. And one reason is uh, it's obviously that math is difficult and important. Uh, and I guess it also, e you can easily, you can easily see how a game <laughs> comes in there while uh, geography, computer science, language might be more challenging to make good games. Not much philosophy. There is much done. philosophy. There might even be other categories. <laughs> yeah. you know? uh, there was uh, actually surgery. So, I mean, uh, this is where games for health and games for education needs. Mm -hmm. um, Natural sciences. I thought, I didn't think the natural sciences would be larger than language, but but that wasn't the case. So this is how it 
their study uh, uh, identified the, uh, the topics being uh, in which games had a place in again a person in a school context, not education games overall, but in a school context. So, what methods have used experiments? They, they develop something and then they put it out, hopefully randomly accessed or, or randomly identified students and uh, allocated to, to the uh, game versus non-game alternative and they run real experiments. Quasi experiments are... Do you guys know what a quasi experiment is? Scientific methodology, I think you really did mention. Okay, you're gonna have to tell them what a quasi experiment is. Yeah, so you don't typically have a, a random selection of the uh, the uh, users that you, you study. So. You, so you basically you let people pick. Right? So in, in normal experiments, what I do is is <clears throat> so for drug tests, um, I don't let you choose whether or not you take the drug or not, right? I either give you the drug or a sugar pill. I don't know which one it is, and you don't know which one it is, right? But in a quasi experiment, you say, well, you know, um, I can't force you to watch a whole bunch of, of horror movies. Do so I want to study the effect of horror movies on five year olds? I'm not going to select randomly five year olds and show them a bunch of horror movies, right? That, that, so I can't get ethics for that. But you know, I can do a quasi experiment where I ask people and their parents <laughs> and their parents how much they watch. So I don't intervene. I don't allocate the groups. I let them sort of self-select, which leads to some problems, right? This is particularly with violent video games, because I'm not going to get a bunch of teenagers to. I'm not going to force people to play violent video games. So most of the studies on violent video games are quasi experiments because they. Ask people how much how much uh, how much time they've been playing violent games, and then they see their behaviour. But you know, a preference for violent content may be a symptom of a violent attitude to life. So the games might not be the cause of this, and because we're not finding some random independent allocation of violent games to, to people, we're letting them pick. But the fact that I pick violent games might be just a symptom of my like need for violence rather than the cause of my violence. So you have to bring that as representative as the <coughs> yeah. experiments. Yeah. So you have to be careful anytime you see quasi experiment, you have to be you have to look what's the cause and effect. Is yeah. it the self selection that's creating the, the the result? So we're mixing methods, some are doing just smaller pilot studies and a little bit chunk of others. But you can see that the real experiments is, I guess. For journals, reasonably high. Yeah, reasonably high. So it's 50%. Um, educational context is about 50% as well. Uh, in the elementary school, some secondary, some higher education. And others, I, I don't remember what's in the others category. Um, in professional education, oh, right. um, the, the surgery. Yeah, uh, yeah, surgery, yeah, um, yeah. yeah um, adult. They were said school context or formal school context, so. Yeah. Well, a hospital, yes. Yeah. So, so this is uh, elementary school is quite high on the list. And I, I guess that's because that's probably where there's a larger market as well. More students going to school. So. No, easier it's to it's the, I think it's, it's, it's sort of easier. More, yeah, the it's, it's, complexity of what you're teaching is simpler, so it's easier. To it's less it. about that reasoning, uh, reflection, theory building and stuff. So. Then the effectiveness. Um, they're, uh, they're, um, they're divided into two groups, depending on whether the developers were assessing the results or they had some independent coming in. So they had 17 studies where they had independent developers coming in and 21 where they were developers. And if you add that up, you're going to find two missing and those two probably had a very clear description of, of which one, the, how the reason was. So the independent evaluator are largely positive effects. Now the question is, would it, does it have a positive effect on the learning, learning activities? And it has positive effects. Now what these effects are, 
and how significant they are, are is not discussed <coughs> in this paper. It just says that there are positive effects. Negative effects? What? Lim? What are some negative effects? Or some demonstrating that the game does worse or than the regular existing way of teaching? And a few inconclusive. What's interesting is that if you look at where the developer was evaluator, it's a bit different. Uh, I mean, the number of negative is about the same, but there are more inconclusive experiments. Um, the interesting, I've made these pie charts because they put all the data there, so you, you won't find these in the um, in the uh, their paper. They just have one pie chart where it, these two combine. So, so all the pie charts I've shown was I, I made them, but and this is where I I was a little bit surprised to see that they are saying that in in other pa other research have shown the opposite effect, so namely that if the developer was the evaluator, you would see more positive outcome here. They're kind of suggesting that they see it here as well, but not as strong. They would say you see the opposite. <laughs> That's what I would say. But according to the authors, it, it shows a little bit of that bias here as well. But I would say that there is no such a bias here. Mm -hmm using their numbers and uh, assuming that their, the table of raw data that they have included is correct. And they were even saying that uh, 14 out of 17 and 14 out of 21. I think 14 out of, out of 21 is a lower number than 14 out of 17, so. <laughs> okay, this, uh, at least this is, uh, we see that there, are, and, and this is something that we see in many studies. You just don't know. It may, it may not. It's not very conclusive whether it's better or not. And uh, we don't, I think this is uh, something you see as well. You don't see a lot of negative uh, results. And that's probably, we we'll, might talk about that in one other paper. Might be that they refocus the research. If they find that it's a negative, they refocus the research and publish it. Uh, uh, they don't go to publish negative uh, results. So they typically focus on something else. So the paper is rewritten into something different. So that might be that there are more studies with negative results. They are not just published. There is no tradition for publishing negative results here in this world. So. You going, um, you know, have you had a discussion on publication bias? Okay, so when, so when you're studying, um, what you find is um, if you imagine that you have um, kind of a size of effect and there's here, there's the zero, right? And so you have a look and you're, you're studying something and you see that there'll be a, um, and often they'll talk about, so this is zero effect and this is loss effect, and this is size of study. Okay, so um, if you study, so if you have like one person, okay, it's very hard to get statistically significant results because you've only got one person and you can't really say that they're representative. And so the further you go here, the, the more valuable, right? because um, you've got like a lot of people. But usually you're closer to, let's say this is the real effect. Then what we have is we'll have, if, if you think of sampling, you'll get a normal, a cone like this, because <coughs> there are events occurring, randomly selected, because you know, as you get a smaller sample, you get more random variation in what you're sampling. So as you get like one individual, you might get one guy here, you might get one guy here, you go one guy here, you might get one guy here, right? Because you know it's a bit of a random effect. As you increase the number of people you sample, their averages start coming towards the actual true average. The problem is, if you do this meter analysis, you generally only see that half, which means you your average is usually higher than it's supposed to be because you're not seeing these ones. Because the researchers who got those went, oh, too bad. Damn, it didn't work. <laughs> we can't really publish that we got it wrong, can we? So they never publish. So all you see is this skewed sample, which makes the effect size look larger because there are a bunch of studies that did show with 20 people you had this negative association. But we never published it. Because there's also like a threshold down here where, and if you've got one here, you might publish that we had a significantly negative effect in our, in our, uh, by using the game with our 20 people. It still could be, 
that the game could actually be here, but you're just within this, and but there's like we've got 95% confidence interval issue, okay? And so you've got to kind of understand that there is this going to be this publishing bias. So even if you see these survey papers, eh, there might be some which are negative or inconclusive that are just not being published. Can it also be that they're ones writing this paper uh, with the select? those that were published in, like, because they were maybe more positive than the one of consensus and stuff like that? <laughs> maybe I they guess, want I guess to be It depends, testing. but, but there is definitely, definitely a tendency in journals to not publish too many of these okay. negative. So there is a little bit about <coughs> just, I, I, I don't know, maybe, I haven't looked at the, whether the uh, conferences is a little bit different, so in the conferences is a little bit different, I, I don't know. It's, uh, also, your, your question about these guys, this is why they're very specific about their search criteria. So rather than just saying, we found a bunch of papers, they, they try and say, okay, you could repeat our process to come, is very important to come up with, this, with kind of the same group of papers we did by using these inclusion terms and using this exclusion method. And you can run it from 2005, 2015, and, and you'll get a slightly different set, a different sample. And then you could see if, if you came up with the same results. But the, the idea is to try and avoid potential bias and try and be very explicit about what you do. And that's what we'll, we will ask you guys to do as well when you do research yourself, is to be very explicit about your methods and very kind of write down what you do rather than just kind of, you know, hack away until it works. So it's uh, actually noting down that for your own, like for your own best as well, noting down the keywords that you use for searching because if you do a search at the beginning of your study, and when you are about to write a paper, you make want to make sure that no new papers have come up in the meantime. You will like to rerun the, the, the queries. It's a good idea to have the exact queries so um, you can rerun them. Web of Science, ISI Web of, web of Knowledge. Um, you can store. I, I, I set up, you, you set up stored searches, and you can set up for it to run, and then tell you if there's anything new on the list um, since it last ran. And so I, I, I set up, when I was doing my PhD, I set up all of those reminders, right? So every week, if somebody published something that was within my Area. group of very specific terms or cited one of my papers, it would tell me, yeah, someone cited you or someone, someone made a new paper that looks very much like the area you're studying, right? So it would, it would automatically do that for me. So that's quite useful for your own thesis is to, to find these keywords, find ones that give you the good group of papers. And then just leave that running automatically. If something comes up, bang, you get the new, newest version. Okay, so a um, little bit of reflections on the paper. This is continuing what Sam was just saying. Uh, they do a quite a good job in discussing earlier surveys and saying why the earlier surveys aren't enough. Because they are looking at the what it has an effect or not. And the earlier surveys did not have that aspect discussed. And they have a very detailed and good description of design, so it is possible to reproduce. And they even show the results in raw data. So what I did is I put all the data. So the diagrams you can see here are not in the original paper. All the pie charts I've shown you is the one I made because we have their data. They did provide me the data. So I could done, do my own analysis. I can pray, make my own uh, statistics based on their data, which is a good thing, and you don't see that very often. You don't see any researchers in our field reveal their data, they just reveal you, they give you the conclusion. So, so I think this uh, this is uh, really nice about the study. You can test and, and check that what they conclude, what they, what they discuss, is in fact uh, valid based on the data they have. Then of course you have to assume that data is correct, but that we have to assume. Weaknesses. I think some of the discussions are a little bit short. So, for instance, this uh, bias, the uh, evaluated bias, I could just bring up two pie charts to show that what they are saying, just in a half a sentence, isn't really what I can give on data. So, so there are a couple of places where I think they could have discussed more. Um, and they, the paper doesn't define or discuss whether has a positive effect on learning is significant. I mean, 
has a positive effect, yeah, what type of effect? The students are more, more motivated? Well, that is typically what the Hawthorne effect. If you do something different, the students are more happy, they're more motivated for a period. Will that taper off? We don't know. So, yeah, there, there, there might be, you might want to run more studies on, on uh, some of these uh, 10 papers to, to look at what type of effects. How, were the effects just short term effects or, or effects that last for longer? So, so there is definitely the possibility to do more studies on existing uh, paper theory, but then you need to be a little bit more specific on what you study because you know now that it seems to be, in general, it seems to have a positive effect on learning, but not known well, how significant, what type of effect, that's not clear from this paper. Um, the, the English word significant is one that, that we, well, that is used in two ways, and I get irritated by when it's used incorrectly. Um, when we're talking about statistical significance, you'll read this in papers you read. They'll talk about things being a significant difference between two things. Now, unfortunately, in English, that means two things. Right? One, they could be meaning statistically significant. Right? In that sense, if I'm building a, um, uh, an engine, right, a car engine, I could um, say, right, okay, we've got this car engine from this manufacturer generates 502 horsepower, and this one generates 504 horsepower. Now, because the, the factories are perfect, these ones always generate between 501 and 503 horsepower, these ones always generate between 504 and 506 horsepower. Okay, because they're really, they're, they're really finely machined and they generate almost identical. They have a statistically significant difference between the two. Because when I do a sample, if I get one that's a 503, I know it comes from factory number one. Because factory number two never generates a 503. The lowest they've ever generated is a 504. So their average is 505. They're 503, so this, a 503 definitely came from factory number one. So it is statistically significantly different. Is it significantly faster? Is it significantly better? Well, no, it's like one, like a half a percent, go, but 0.2 of a percent better. Right? But you know, it's statistically significant because of my ability to measure the difference. So you'll see that used in, in the both ways. You'll see people say there was a significant improvement. Do they mean that the actual improvement was big? Or do they mean statistically we could see that the very fine measurement meant that one was slightly bigger than the other? Right? And that gets confused. And you'll see people. Should I use a different word here? Well, no, no, no. no, no. It, it, but this is an ex a point. Yeah. So, so, so what I mean here is that it has a real impact to the point that it actually, because what we're going to see is that if you want to make a game, you need to invest a lot. And for that investment to make sense, you need to have really a strong <laughs> impact. It would be nicer mm. if statistical significance was, was replaced by the word measurable. Yeah, that's right. Right? Because that's what statistical significance means, a measurable difference. I can't, yeah, can you find that you can measure the difference? That doesn't say anything about this. Besides, it just means it's measurable. Well, so I think that yeah. you had you had the option to answer this in the uh, scientific methodology exam. This is one of the questions in the exam, so you had already a chance to discuss that. So you should. Have <laughs> 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 irritating. Um, measurable versus significant. So yeah. Um, yeah. What, what I mean here is whether it has uh, a real, uh, real impact. So I think probably, probably use impact rather than significant. Yeah. yeah. It has real uh, did any of you read the paper differently? Any questions or issues that I think I'm misreading or, or what did you think of the paper? It was okay. No paper. I think the square one was the most interesting, apart from the double alignment, which made it very hard to read on the eyes. Yeah. Well. Yeah. No. Unfortunately, that was that. It, it, yeah. <laughs> That's the, the, the unformatted version of the paper, right? Because, yeah, um, so. so. So let me give you the storyline here. Right? So I was thinking, starting with this general, two general papers, one on learning styles, educational setting, and the other one on survey of 
where is the where is this being used? But I agree with you. The the more interesting, as especially uh, as, as a real case, this is why paper and we do that on Thursday. Yep. And we get to do and it's uh, well designed, even though as Simon was saying, it's more to read than what we usually read. It's it's well designed and it has some interesting uh, interesting mm. results. So so we'll do that on uh, on Thursday as one example of, of what an uh, educational system might be, and also one that, uh, as I said before, is not just in this active experiment area, it's more on the uh, helping the students and the teachers, and one interesting thing I see there is that games don't replace teachers, games may work very well if they work in line with them and uh, according to the teachers' plans, that's what we're trying to inspire at, so we'll talk about that on Thursday. And I mean, you could, you could also say that you know we're we are doing a selection of papers for you to read in this course and in the, the mobile course, for example. And so you could be critical of our selection process, right? Because um, what is the selection process we're using? Well, it's partly a it's things I found interesting and the stuff and I, I found, and that's different from you. Okay. Yeah, and stuff that Runa finds interesting and stuff that Marius found interesting, right? We haven't necessarily done this kind of systematic. Anyway, also some of the courses are, I, I'm, I'm quite open for you guys, having read one of these, uh, looking at something like uh, Web of Science and looking the, um, who cites this paper, have you guys used that feature of your database searches? Um, so Web of Science and the other ones will do, you'll find a paper you like, and you'll see a link to who cited this paper. And that's of the, the more modern ones that are using that as a reference. Go and have a read some of that. If you find one you like, we're more than happy for you to review that one, include in the course, get other people to read it, because you know, you think it was valuable and you guys are becoming master's students, and so you're supposed to be able to do that lead things, not just be followers. So we want you to start kind of contributing, participating in that way. So our selection strategy isn't rigorously singular focused. It's it's more kind of organic. Because we have we have some topics, issues. Uh, challenges that we would like to discuss, and these are examples that would help us discuss these, uh, these issues. Uh, and the other thing um, you may may think of is uh, we will be kicking off the integration project later on. So it might be so if you already see now that something here that interests you, there might be a topic that you would like to pursue in the integration project. Then it's not the wasted. Uh, effort in doing a literature study in that direction right now because you may come up with some papers you could review here and that would bring ideas for what the integration project should be about. Yeah, because we want you to start thinking about the integration project so that you can start coming up with some things you'd like to try. It's a 10 point course, right? So it's supposed to be 300 hours. No. Um, and we'd like you to do it in groups and we'd like you to include multiple parts of the, the, the course. So. And um, we did discuss, uh, we will come back to this, but, but just to let you know, we did discuss whether we're going to do the same as we did in the uh, Applied Computer Science Project, mm -hmm. meaning that we will come up with ideas and you just sign on to ideas, but we discussed with Stein who's going to do the uh, innovation uh, or the digital entrepreneurship uh, course, and he would like to leave that idea generation process. So you will be part of you will be working with him to come up with ideas for integration projects. That's just why it might be an idea for you to already find the direction and start looking for papers. Uh, in relation to the, the like, for instance, uh, the, the, the different combos, uh, mm -hmm. if you're going to do, for instance, mobile and web, does it have to be, for instance, the same application on the mobile or web, or could the web part be the back end, for instance, of yeah. the administrator doing some Things. Yeah, well, uh, yes, there, there will be one of the same system, I hope. Uh, so, I mean, that the front end needs to get data from the back end, which is a web based back end. So, yeah. but, but you can, you don't have to, I mean, as you're going to see from, from Thaddeus' web course, RESTful services, web based services, web based back ends. You don't have to use the web in the front end to use a web based system. Yeah. The web technology is also a back end technology, it's not just the front end, so you can use a different front end. Yeah. So if you were thinking of a yeah, so I, very specific, sort of tangibly, yes, you make a mobile app, 
but you have the web client for the administrator to, to develop. And don't even have that. I mean, that if you use a REST type of protocol and use web uh, doing it exclusively as a backend, yeah, yeah, exactly. No JS or, mm. or some Java web server. Yeah, because I was like thinking that if the actual user is on the mobile bus, there's also the possibility to access the web page to have a profile and have stuff. Who could? Yeah. Yeah. That would be a perfectly reasonable combination. Yeah. But you're combining both yeah. web technologies and, uh, and the ones, so that's fine.